Cora TV. The world is thinking. I mean, I think that uh, for me, it, it, it's interesting because I'm 42 years old and I'm finally uh, proud to say my name is Iran and look at the world. You know, um, the, I dropped my name when the hostages were taken because I was embarrassed and now I'm proud. And I think that's because the last 30 years have been an exercise in theocracy and uh, the history of Iran has proven that whether it was the Arabs or the Mongols or the uh, British or the American influence or the Russian influence that the culture of Iran and Persia uh, prevails. And I think that that is what we as uh, perhaps, uh, you know, Iranian, Iranians who, who, who have a yearning to have civil society and to have a situation where we can express our views are still very much longing to see that in our homeland. Um, I think that uh, you, you can see in history that 100 years ago in 1906 with the Constitutional Revolution, there was a chance to have a parliament that uh, allowed for the you know various people to uh, have their views. But of course, that uh, throughout history was diminished, and then the Islamic Revolution happened. So, uh, when I look at the future, I take great I have great hope in uh, politically active women who are invisible, because I believe that if you take the case of Iraq. We interviewed an Iraqi secular intellectual in 2003, right before the invasion, and, and he told us it's not enough for Iraqi intellectuals to be in cyber cafes in Baghdad talking about democracy. Because on every street corner there is a mosque, and it is the men of religion who are telling the people of Iraq what their destiny is and what their lives are about. And so when you talk about the need for democratic institutions and for people to learn about what it means to protest, you know, nonviolently and to have uh, rights and to want a civil society. I think there are politically active women now, both religious and secular, who are working within the framework of Islam, and that is, of course, what's controversial. They're working within the framework of Islam to reform it. And there are many different viewpoints, of course, and as a journalist, I get to hear many different viewpoints. And I think one viewpoint is that for there to be a lasting change, one that will uh, pr allow Iran to be able to breathe, to be able to be free, is that um, you create these grassroots uh, efforts where, uh, for example, this past summer, the Nobel laureate Shireen Abadi uh, has a um, mission where she wants to gather a million signatures from Iranian men and women, and she's not doing it alone. It's other lobbies that are doing it, to go door to door and to talk to women and men about the discriminatory laws in Iran today. And uh, this is not marching on Tehran University and uh, you know, wanting another revolution. But perhaps the question is, do we need to have these grassroots you know, efforts so that the people themselves learn about the importance, that they actually can say no, or they actually can say that they disagree with something? And there was a uh, scholar who I met in Oslo who had come to honor Shireen Abadi, and she had spent six months in the courts of the Islamic Republic of Iran watching the women negotiate with the judges. And she thought that that was, even though in, you know, incremental, it was a tremendous exercise in speaking and asking for what it is that you think you are deserved. And so, you know, it's again, not a, one of those tangible changes that you can see that is going to happen overnight. But uh, it's, a, it's an inspiring uh, to hear those stories.